Okay, good morning, everyone. Shall we uh, kneel to open with prayer? God in heaven, we thank you for our blessings. We thank you for the great things that you've done. We thank you for a powerful methodology that allows us to see where we are, what's happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future. We pray on this Sabbath that we may uh, observe it as you uh, instructed us to. We may give you all glory and honour and that you may be pleased with our worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the study we're looking at today is the Apis Bull of Warning, and it's from October of 2020. So a couple of years ago, almost. Um, and what we're going to do is we're looking at uh, the Apis Bull, comparing it and contrasting it with ancient Israel and modern Israel <clears throat> and seeing the lessons that we can learn from that. But to begin with, if we... Let me just pull this up. Okay. To begin with, let's, first of all, <clears throat> I've got on the board here um, just some lines and let's just start by if I ask you what have I drawn if anyone wants to just unmute themselves or just say in the chat uh, I've got it open so what have I drawn here on the board yeah. what lines you have the um like the on the left, I see the Millerite, or actually it would be the, um, I'm sorry, Alpha and Omega. So you've got on the left is the Alpha, and on the right you have the Omega, and it could fit um, both the ancient and the modern. Yes. So because I've just got the Alpha and the Omega, we don't, we don't know. I haven't got any more detail on this. So um, yes, Christine, you, you're correct. We don't know if it's ancient or modern. So when we start labeling this, then we can begin to um, understand. So first of all, we know we've got <clears throat> our alpha and our omega. We've got two groups here that are part of the church that get uh, taught and, and trained to give a message and then we've got the world which is the third group so we're going to we're going to put some a couple of labels on this we're not going to fill them all in um, today but it's just to just to keep the structures in our mind but we want to as we go through today's study we want to remember the Eden to Eden model, which is the top line that I have here. Eden to Eden. And we're all very familiar with this line, how the principle of at the very beginning where now, all the way down here, we're trying to get back to Eden. So somewhere down here, we have the second advent. And what do we have after the second advent? Well, how many years? Thousand. Thousand. So we've got the second advent, 
and then we've got a thousand years and then we return to Eden. So when we look at the beginning, we come back all the way over here, we have what happens to, to Adam and Eve, they're in Eden and then they make a decision, they vote. And what, what do we call that? That's, that's a sin, isn't it? So we have a downfall. And because of that, we have a, a curse, which we understand is more in the context of um, this is a result of your vote, of what's going to happen down the track. We have this curse, and then after it's around 1500 years, what happens? We have, we have Eden, we have the curse, Adam and Eve, and then around 1500 years later, the, the world's in what kind of condition? Deep, deep sin, and we have the flood. <laughs> yes. So we have, see if I can, that's, looks like a house on top of a banana, but it's, it's supposed to be a, an ark. Um, but I'll put some rain here just to make that a little bit more obvious of what, what's, what's going on. Um, So we have these these uh, these fifteen hundred years to around fifteen hundred years to then the flood. Um, this has been quite quite general. Uh, then we have, if we add say a thousand years, we get to then the time of Moses. So we have in this whole time period. We have about two and a half thousand years from the very beginning. And to and this is where we mark the beginning of ancient Israel. So the point is we have the flood, 1500 years after the fall. And how much do well, how, how much, uh, how many written scriptures do, do God's people have? How much do they know about God in, in a written form up to this point? None. None, right? Yeah, they, they don't have, they don't have anything written down. And do we know why that is? Their oral, their traditions were oral traditions, weren't they? They spoke it? Yeah, they had... Um, oral traditions, they didn't see the need for it. Um, perhaps they were smarter humans, they had better e exact methods of doing things, better memory. Able, able to remember, yeah, and, and teach and share the stories. Yeah, exactly. But what happens after the flood? What happens to their condition after the flood? Start to deteriorate. Yeah. What happens to their lifespans? They're all their yeah. Really shortened, yeah. They really decrease, they deteriorate. So then as a result, their record keeping of, of what God's like, um, in which they've been doing in their memory, they haven't been writing down. So then you can see this gradual deterioration and this, yeah, correct, Susan, dim diminish, um, how their understanding of what God's character is diminishes. So then it becomes necessary 
for them to have some kind of written form of, of what God's like. So we get to the beginning of ancient Israel with Moses and God's people have, have forgotten what he's like. They're in Egypt. And if we go to, it's, let's see, where can I Review and Herald. It's Review and Herald, January 9, 1894. Paragraph six. I hope that you can see that. But we're only going to read a small portion from it. Um, we're not going into great detail. So they, ancient Israel, had been corrupted by idolatry. And the time came when God called them forth from Egypt in order that they might obey his laws and keep his Sabbath, which he had instituted in Eden. So back at the beginning of Eden, Adam and Eve, had, uh, they had personal, personal contact with God, but that came to an end at the fall. So then there's this 1,500 years where they're only just talking about God. There's nothing written. They can't read it. And by the time we get all the way down here, like we said, they've got quite a, a diminished understanding of what God's like. So... This, their, their understanding or their, their condition is so damaged that they need to um, come out of that. They're obviously in captivity by this time, and that's why Moses, God sends Moses to bring them out of that captivity. <clears throat> so with that in mind, if, um, Elaine, if I ask you, who understands God's character better? Would you understand God's character better or would William Miller understand God's character better? We would. Yeah. You know, and why is that? Well, my best way to explain it is we have more light now than he had then. Yeah. So we've had more time to understand a parable methodology and that's really what unlocks God's character for us. We'll go into that in a little bit later. But yeah, so the point is uh, when we think of people like William Miller or Martin Luther or um, Peter, John the Baptist, Moses, we have a better understanding of who God is compared to them. Abraham didn't understand that slavery was a sin. He didn't know that polygamy was a sin. But as we look at our Eden to Eden line, we're all the way, you know, down here. God's slowly and gradually restoring his image, which is his character and that's because we're understanding who he is. So coming back to Moses and ancient Israel, Moses is part of that damaged system because he's been uh, in Egypt for so long. He's been corrupted by the idolatry there. They've had no written word as a reference to come back to. So they're... God has to lead them into the wilderness. He has to take them away from all these corrupting influences. But what do they do in the wilderness? The, the, the topic of our, our study today, the apis bull or the golden calf, they create that golden calf. So... Ancient Israel's waiting for Moses on Mount Sinai and they're 
they're damaged by all their idolatry in Egypt and they make this they make this apis bull they recreate the god that they're familiar with from Egypt and but all they do is they they say this isn't the apis bull well we're going to take that label off this is god this is the the god of, of ancient israel this isn't this isn't the, the god of egypt so all they've done is, is taken the, the name badge off the bull and put God's name badge on there. They've created a God in their own image. So they did this because they witnessed the worship of the Apis bull in Egypt and naturally they thought it totally okay to build a golden calf. And we've got to remember that at this time, they still didn't have any written word. They were just going by word of mouth. And as the human conditions degrading as well, memory and things failing, their, that, that understanding of God's character is dwindling. So they have no reference point to know essentially what's right and, and wrong. So with this God that they've created, they're saying that this is a representation of our God. They don't think that they're actually worshiping a, a different God, but in reality, because they've put a, their, their understanding of God's character, they've, uh, yes, Susan, they've repackaged it and they're not actually worshiping God because they don't understand his character. This is their, their prototype of what God should look like in their own minds because they want a warlike God. They want a God that's a king that's going to kill their enemies and fight their battles. Can anyone remember some other characteristics of the Apis bull? Fighting spirit? Yeah, it had a fighting spirit. Anyone else? Susan put in strength. Yep, strength. Uh, we said that it was Conquering. a king like. Sorry? Conquering. Conquering, yeah. I'll put um, conquering king because they believed in uh, that that uh, they needed a, a king, you know, male uh, head figure. So fertility. yeah, what was the last one? Sorry. Oh, fertility. Fertility. So, uh, fertility. Yep. So they have all these characteristics that they know from the Apis bull in Egypt that they've just overlaid over God. And they've done that because that's what they're, that's what's natural to them. That's what they're comfortable with. That's what their prototype is of a God. So they, they have this conquering king 
who's fertile and that's very strong. Um, <clears throat> and all these things were subscribed to God. Now, once they enter Canaan, they get to <clears throat> a place called Rama. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it means <clears throat> it means a state of idolatry. Does anyone know when they get to Rama, what happens? What do they ask for? A king. What does ancient Israel? They ask for a king. They ask for a king, yeah. So they get in, they, they go, well, <clears throat> we believe God is, you know, a conquering king, he's fertile, very strong, has a fighting spirit. We need, just like all the other nations around us, we need someone at the, the top to give us a, a king. And they ask for this because of their understanding of the Apis bull. So they want a king. What do they get? God gives them a king. And where do they end up? They end up in, down the road, they end up in Babylon. And Babylon's purpose is to cure them of their idolatry, to get rid of any more of the images that they have. But what's the problem? If Babylon, if when they're in Babylon, they, they're cleansed of their, let's put it, When they get to so they're in Babylon and after Babylon they end up going oh yeah we've got this this image this form so we need to get rid of that so they get rid of the form that they get rid of the form of their idolatry, but what's left is the character or the spirit of that idol. So the spirit is still there. So we'd say they've really only done half a job. And when it comes to eternity, you can't do half a job. You've got to do the whole job. So the greatest danger they had <clears throat> um, back here when they, when Moses was on the mountain, they made this apis bull. The greatest danger wasn't in in the form; it was in the spirit. Because you can get rid of the form, but you can still have the spirit and that means you're still um, in idolatry. So if you believe in God, but you don't know his character, you're going to mold a God in your own image with your own hands based upon your understanding of what God is like. So when we come to... If this is, we have here, um, say, the cross, and um, 
So just for illustrative purposes, if this is John the Baptist here, and what does John believe in? What kind of king does John believe in? Strong, courageous. John the Baptist. Conquering. <laughs> a conquering king. Yeah. He believes in a, in a warrior king. He believes uh, that, that God's going to clean his house and destroy the Romans. And why is he saying this? Why is he saying that we're going to have this king come along, this Messiah who's going to clean up? Um, because of what his dad taught him. Get us out of captivity. Because of what his dad taught him in the prophecy. Um, go ahead. Is it Phil? Yep. Oh, are you done? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say what you just said. First of all, that's what he learned from his dad and from the priesthood, from the church. And secondly, nobody would have cared if they, nobody would have cared if he taught the, the true message of, well, you got to walk two miles if somebody asks you to walk one. You got to turn the other cheek and nobody would have really followed. So that, yes. so that even though it was a mistake, it's just kind of God let it happen. So it would, it would draw the people. If we go to signs of the time is May 8th. Eighteen ninety three. Signs of the Times, May eight, eighteen ninety three, paragraph nine, and it says, "As he, Christ, came in his humiliation to our earth, no conquering armies were visible to mortal eyes." And the unbelieving Jews decided that he could not be the illustrious king for whom they were looking, as there was no outward display. So Christ is standing right in front of them, right in front of ancient Israel, and they couldn't recognize him. They didn't, they didn't know that it was the Son of God. And this is a repeating pattern of what happens in um, not only this history of success. When we come down to our time, Many people have, don't recognize what what Christ looks like in our time. So, because they're steeped in idolatry, just like John the Baptist was with his understanding of God's character. So, when we look at, when we come back again, to the uh, Alpha of ancient Israel. And the Ten Commandments have just been given. The people are afraid. So if we're back in Exodus 20, we take our minds back there. If someone could read Exodus 20 verses... 18 to 22. I can. 18 to sure, 22. Thank you. Yes. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let no, 
let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your eye, your faces, that ye sin not. Thank you. So these people are afraid because of all these thunderings and lightnings. They're standing, I think in the next verse it says, they're standing afar off. They don't want to speak with God directly. They only want to speak through Moses. And because they they have this, this fear of... Um, of God. In Patriarchs and Prophets, it's in chapter 27. We're just going to take a few excerpts from, it's around page 300. around page 303 and a little bit from 305 and later. Um, but we're just going to take a few gems from, the, from that chapter. Um, Israel was now to be taken into a close and peculiar relation to the Most High, to be incorporated as a church and nation under the government of God. The message... For the people was, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So they're going to be a peculiar they're going to have a close and peculiar relation with the Most High. They're going to be a church and a nation under God, a true church and state union. But what God did here is he revealed himself not just in the awful majesty of the judge and lawgiver, but as a, compass a compassionate guardian of the people. And the 10 precepts, the 10 commandments that he gives them are brief, but also comprehensive, but cover the duty of man to God. And as we know, also um, humans to their fellow humans. But it's all based upon this fundamental principle of love. And this is something that gets forgotten because ancient Israel still has this idea of God being a conquering king and um, strong and, and, and going to defeat all, all of Israel's enemies. So the minds of the people were blinded and debased by slavery and heathenism from Egypt, <clears throat> and they were not prepared to fully appreciate the far-reaching principles of these 10 precepts. So casting our minds to uh, not that long ago, when We've mentioned before about Obama and him considering the Constitution as the North Star. So could Thomas Jefferson see the far-reaching principles of the Constitution? No. The problem is with how people interpret the Constitution that, that bring them to their conclusions. 
we bring that back to ancient Israel, how they interpret the Ten Commandments, how they interpret God's character, then brings them to a conclusion that's not correct about what God's really like. Because we know that he's not all of these things. So we can see the overall picture with the Eden to Eden study from the beginning to the end, and we can see how God's restoring his image in us. So for ancient Israel, he gave them a lot of what they wanted. He was trying to show them his love because they asked for a king with the wrong motives, but he gave it to them because they didn't want him to speak to them directly. He had to speak through Moses. They didn't want to, uh, they wanted to be like the other nations in having a, a head, an actual person at uh, the, the top leading them as a conquering king with a fighting spirit. So God is restrained by their own condition. He can only do so much. We know that he never forces anyone. And that's one of his, based upon his fundamental principle of love. They had the Ten Commandments. God says, you have to be nice to your slaves. He didn't say, don't have slaves. But when, he come, when we come down to a later history, what is God going to say? He's going to say, when we get to the time of Ellen White and the Millerites, it's going to say, slavery is not okay. You need to get, get rid of that. So it's a higher standard. The, the further you come down, God's raising the bar. So when we look at modern Israel, We go to 1798 and God's people are meant to come out of idolatry. But what idolatry? What idolatry are they in, in 1798? Protestantism. Yeah, they're in apostate Protestantism. Right. And all through this history, they're in apostate Protestantism. So ancient Israel had to come out of the pagan nations. Modern Israel had to come out of apostate Protestantism. But somewhere in modern Israel's alpha history, they go into Laodicea. And then we get to... we get to the 1888 time period and what are they meant to do they're meant to come out of that condition they're meant to come out of that idolatry but we understand that it was a history of failure so When we come all the way down here, we have our history. Which begins with 1989. And where was, where were we in 1989? What was Elder Jeff neck deep in? We're in Laodicea. Yes. Conspiracy theories. 
or in conspiracy theory? And where do we get those from? Apostate Protestantism. Yeah. So even though um, yes, apostate Protestantism, it's idolatry. And he didn't, or Elder Jeff and many of us didn't understand the true character of God, just like the Millerites didn't. They didn't understand. Um, and ancient Israel didn't understand. So, but as we get further along, we know slavery was, God said, be nice to your slaves, to ancient Israel. To the beginning of modern Israel, it was don't have slaves. So at the beginning, we didn't understand what our whole, dis our whole dispensation was going to be about. We didn't understand what God was actually like, how we're supposed to treat other people. But as we go along, he's, God is giving us through parable methodology. That's the key that unlocks all, um, that unlocks who he is to us. So what we're doing is we're just trying to consider idolatry from a different perspective in this study. And that it's not just, well, we can get rid of the form, we can get rid of slavery, we can still have the mindset. So the important thing is to not only get rid of the form, but get rid of the spirit as well. So ancient Israel had the Apis bull. And what did our idol look like? When we begin here, as we've already said, we need parable teaching to give us the understanding of God. And why did this upset some people early on for us in the Omega of modern Israel? It upset them because they had a prototype of what God was like in their mind from apostate Protestantism. And because they've been in that idolatry for so long, when parable methodology, we're understanding that, says to us, God isn't like that at all. God's actually like this. We've got this prototype in our mind and we're going, well, I'm looking at this. I'm, look, I'm comparing them both. They're not the same. That's not the God I serve. But when, we, when we're back here, what type of God is that? It's a white male Republican. That's the kind of mindset of who God is. And what starts to be undone is our whole concept of God's character at the beginning. So when we get all the way down to 2018, When we get all the way down here, what do we have in 2018? What happened? Midnight cry. Yeah, the midnight cry. So we get the midnight cry and what's occurring is that idol that we have, that we've formed, is beginning to be dismantled. It's being taken down and 
many people were not willing to give up their idol worship. So <clears throat> some people some people look at this and, and they say, look, these are these are really good lines. They're all very interesting, um, interesting patterns. Love it. I have no major problem with the message, but where in all of this is the love of God? Where is where is that experience? Where um, we need to spend more time just thinking about God and dwelling on God, thinking about how how nice Jesus was and the sacrifice on Calvary. We need to contemplate on more about that. And let me ask you, what's the problem with those kind of statements? Keep our focus on the four instead of the six. Exactly. They're looking at they're not moving forward. Yeah, they're looking at just the first four commandments, how we relate to God. They're not contemplating and uh, thinking about the, the next six commandments, which is how we interact with one another. So if you, I'll give you an example. If, if I come to you one day and I say, I love you. I think about you all the time. I just want to spend every moment of every day with you, contemplating how wonderful you are. And you say to me, what do you think when you do that? What's going through your mind? And my reply is, well, I think you're really nice. And I start to think, and you like to um, you like to cook, you like to play the piano. I think about the pet dog that you love. I want to spend every day thinking about you. Would you feel particularly loved when you realized that I was spending all day thinking about myself? So this is what we do to God. We think about certain characteristics of what we believe God to be like. And this is the apis bull that we've built. This is this idol that we've made um, in our own image. And what we're doing is we're actually just thinking about ourselves. We're not thinking about God. We're thinking about another God that we've made, not what God's character is actually like. So this fictional model in our mind is an idol. And people all over the world do this. Uh, if we think of Catholics, Protestants, Adventists, people in this movement, we worship a God in our own image and we don't need the form for that to be idolatry. And in 2019, we brought this to a head and many of in this movement were worshipping a white conservative Republican male because that's what they were taught was the prototype of who would be a hero, some type of apis bull. And what happened when they were presented with the true character of God? They did the same thing as the Jews did. They were incapable of recognizing who the Messiah was when Jesus actually came. And they were actually incapable of that recognition. And paganism 
also forms God in their own image. Catholicism is a very good example. Let me ask, who in Catholicism, who reveres Mary the most? Is it the conservative Catholics or the liberal Catholics? Is it John Paul II or is it Francis? The conservatives. Yeah, thank you, Mary. It's the conservatives. And why did they why they revere Mary so much? Um, why they lift her up so highly, and they create this this halo around her head, this um, idea of making her holy is because of two things. And you have to have these two. They believe that these two things is what makes her valuable. And the first thing is to have Mary and the first reason, the first reason why she's um, valued in conservative Catholicism is because she's a virgin. An example of this is there was a young girl and one day she was attacked by a man and she caused this man to kill her instead of raping her. And for this, Catholicism made her a saint. She's called the saint of... Pelagia, I think um, you can Google it, but the point is there was this, they thought she was a good girl because she would rather die than lose her virginity. So just thinking about this, because a woman who's lost her virginity from this ultra conservative Catholic point of view, um, it's, it's quite disgusting that this is the, the worth of a, a woman that, that this, um, that Catholicism puts on, uh, conservative Catholicism puts on women. So the first thing is being a virgin. The second is being able to bear children. And this becomes a woman's job function. Um, and you can see how down through the ages, this is how, how women, um, even outside of Catholicism, consider their worth, their value, that if they're a virgin, they're valuable, um, but also they need to be able to bear children. So this whole idea of Mary is just a demonstration of blatant sexism. And because they say that's what gives a woman value. A flesh and blood woman can never reach that standard. Because if we look at the real Mary, she did not die a virgin. She was nothing like that. She was flesh and blood. She had children after Jesus. So they've taken her, they've taken Mary and they've constructed a God in their own image, something that fits their worldview. And it's a completely fictional construct, but it's a very sexist construct. And it's just frankly terrible. But the terrible thing is we do the same thing because what caused the shaking in 2019 was 
the revealing of God's character through parable methodology. And God reveals his character at a certain time. And in early writings, fourteen point one. This is in the history of the time of trouble for the hundred and forty four thousand. And God gives them the time of the second advent. And this way mark is the formalization. So before, before the second advent, all the way down here, before this time, God gives his people he gives them the time of his coming and in early writings 14.1 we read towards the end of the paragraph when God spoke the time he poured upon us the Holy Ghost and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. So when Moses' face shone with glory, uh, with the glory of God, what had he just seen? Ellen White tells us that he'd seen God's character. So it's at the formalization that we're given the glory of God. We're given, we, we see God's character. In, I'm going to run out of room here. Uh, So this is from Review and Herald, May 10, 1887. Paragraph 20. And we're only just taking a few little bits out of it. Um, Okay, we must get ready for the latter rain. The earth is to be lighted with the glory of the third angel. Um, and the message shall go with a loud cry. So when the earth is lighted with the glory of God, of the third angel's message, you would expect to see the earth, the whole earth being lighted. And that's the formalization of the message. When you think of um, the tongues of fire in the upper room, the disciples were lighted up with the glory of God. That actual um, experience, we can think of it like in a spiritualistic way, tongues of fire, lots of, you know, these kind of this kind of spiritualistic manner um, but what was happening is they're seeing God's glory they're seeing his character God's revealing his character to them so the only reason that people can't see God's love in this message in every parabolic component of it to whatever degree that may be is because they're still worshipping God, the God that they've constructed, not the true God. So 
when we understand that it's at formalized the formalization god reveals himself to us we've got to we know through parable methodology that whatever happens at the formalization is the revealing of god's character so right back here right back at the beginning of ancient israel the alpha of ancient israel we're on a, a six thousand year process we're on a six thousand year journey of understanding who god is and it's a slow it's a laborious process because god is patient it's not god that's taking the time it's us that's the ones that are slow to learn and difficult to take things on board and for many people the tests are too hard so to give an example if i hold something in my hand and you try to take it from me it can be easy or it can be hard it depends on whether i'm gripping it very tightly or whether i'm just holding onto it loosely and so this we can take the same concept with our idols if we're holding on to them tightly we don't want to let go of them when the message comes along and says hey you need to start treating people right. You need to start treating women equally. And we go, oh, no, um, the Bible says this and this about men being the head of the house. So I I'm going to wear the pants in the house, for instance. You're holding on to that idolatry. You're holding on to that concept of or that understanding of what God is like. So the tests are only hard if we have a, a strong grip on those idols. Someone said to Elder Tess, you've changed our view so dramatically. You've changed our view of God so, so significantly just don't say anything too radical in the future because, you know, we've, we've come such a long way already. We, we don't want to, you know, we've done so much. How much more can there be to change? And what's wrong with that, that kind of statement is for those saying that what hope is left because we're only uh, at this time in 2020, they're only in the latter rain. Now, of course, we're past harvest for the priests. Um, just wait till you get to the loud cry that lights up the whole earth down here for the 144,000 where God's character is truly revealed. So the problem is if we think that we already know what God's character is like, if we think that where there can't be much more left to learn, then that's dangerous. If, if you loved me, I would want you to know who I am. I'd want you to know what I believe. I'd want you to know what I stand for. And with this movement in the methodology that God has given to us, this is the only way that we can understand what God is like. Every other way, there's, there's a broad path. There's a wide door because it's easy to build God in our own image. It's easy to construct something that we like the look of. What we've been doing as we go from Eden to Eden, as God's been restoring his image, that image is becoming clearer to us. And we're going, oh, that's not, it doesn't look like 
what we thought it would look like. So because we haven't constructed it, we don't know what it's going to look like from the beginning. God's done that. And we're told that if he showed us his glory, it would destroy us. Now, like the tongues of fire, this just sounds quite like a spiritualistic thing. If God, you know, walked past us, we'd be destroyed. <clears throat> but the reason it would destroy us is just like the last dispensation. When the people saw his glory, they didn't want it. When Christ came along, he was rejected. And in turn, that rejection was what destroyed them. God can't show us his glory because we wouldn't want him. So back in 2018, if he'd showed us his glory, we wouldn't want him because we were racist, we were sexist, we were homophobic, we were all these terrible things. So now we're in 2022 we're getting a, a greater and greater understanding of God's character and we should want to get to know God, not the God that we've constructed in our image, but the God through parable methodology, that character that's revealed to us. So we shouldn't care what he looks like because we need to construct ourselves in his image not the other way around if you'll kneel with me shall we close in prayer god in heaven we thank you for this movement we thank you for the patience and love that you've shown to us throughout the beginning of this earth we realized that for a long time we haven't been worshiping you we've constructed an image of ourselves and so as we rid ourselves of these idols as we loosen our grip on these things and allow them to be destroyed we thank you that you've been so gracious to give us parallel methodology to deconstruct, to help us deconstruct our idolatry. I pray that we're continue, we continue to be willing to learn of your true character. And despite the fact that this may take away many idols that we cherish, we know that it's all in our own best interests and for the interests of others that we construct ourselves in your image for your glory and honour. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, thank you. No problems. They're good reminders. Yeah, thank you, Luke. Very good study. Was there uh, any questions at all, perhaps, um, on the Apis Bull or the Eden to Eden model? Or... Oh, you put it together very succinctly, very nicely. I mean, each of those can be a study of its own and in its own but you put it together very nicely. Thank you for your time. Yeah, it's, it's just a, I try and link each thought from the study together. So I hope it, it flowed okay. Yeah, it did. I, I love that you can do it from memory like that. 
uh, I, I have a hard time. I have to read my notes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read my notes too, but it's just, <laughs> it's more just you know some keywords to get the yeah the flow going. But, uh, I love your board too. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, I invested in some better sticky whiteboard thing which works, but it makes a bit of a squeaky noise, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, no, it just then it sounds better, more like a board. That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Oh. Yes, Luke, Jackie uh, was very, very good. Um, there were some points here that I had not put together about Mary. Catholic Church. Yeah, this is quite something being a virgin. And this all came from uh, Catholicism. And the patriarchal system was involved in that as well. Is that true? So it, it more or less came from uh, the Catholicism is just an example of um, this this view of women because it's many it's not just catholicism that that views women in this way um islam has a, a very sexist view or understanding of women a very similar um concept of what their worth is um mm -hmm. so it's it's not mm -hmm. solely from catholicism it's just an example that elder test used i see Kind of amazing with all the different, the histories, the different beliefs, the different understandings. But when it comes to patriarchy, that's embedded in all of it. Yeah. Yeah, from the very yeah. beginning. Wow. Definitely, it's Babylon. Thank you, Luke. Yes, thank you. <laughs> 